is now being recorded. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so very much on this Friday for joining us. Um, we again are going to continue our series of a portrait of a greenhouse leader. And today we are so um, happy to have Terry Rogers, who is the President and CEO of the Episcopal Foundation of Jefferson County, um, the St. Martins and the Pines Greenhouse Homes in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, so, Terry, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mary. It's just a delight to be on here. I love the webinars, too. So uh, happy to be here and to share some of the St. Martin story. Yes, that is so good. So here's just a little bit of um, a background about Terry. He's a lifelong resident of Birmingham. He was a graduate of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Since uh, the year 2000, he has served as the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Episcopal Foundation of Jefferson County, so that includes St. Martin's in the Pines and St. Martin's at Home, which is a continuing care retirement community and a home care service in Birmingham. His career in healthcare administration includes positions with national uh, home health care companies and also hospital systems. He's a member of the Community Advisory Committee for the University of Alabama, the Comprehensive Center on Healthy Aging, a member of the Board of Directors for the Episcopal Housing Foundation, a member of the National Public Policy Congress, Budget and Finance Committee, and the Business Strategy Council for Leading Age. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with Leading Age. Their conference is next week. And Terry also serves on the um, Peer Network Steering Committee. So that kind of gives you a little bit of the official background. So here's a little bit of that unofficial background. So his hobbies include travel, fishing, and he likes to spend as much time as possible at the lake with his wife and his son. So you can see, see those folks there. And then he has another side to him, which is participating as a member of competitive barbecue teams and kind of loves the college football roll tide. So at least on this one, or even the last slide, Terry. I don't know if you want to just give us just a smidgen, little insight into this, what it's all about. Well, well of course. So I'm from Alabama, so we like football and barbecue, right? I mean, it's not uh, uh, it's not possible to live here without those two things. And so I've been uh, uh, cooking barbecue and, and having fun participating in uh, competitions for a long time. And, uh, and, and this week, by the way, on the college football side, is, we call it hate week. Uh, tomorrow is the University of Alabama versus the University of Tennessee. So it's a huge rivalry in SEC college football. So it, it's fun. Uh, Tennessee Orange versus Alabama Crimson. And, and we unfortunately at, here at St. Martin's have a couple of Tennessee graduates. So it's been an ugly day, an ugly week to see the orange color around uh, some this week. But uh, we are confident that the Crimson Tide will, will come rolling through tomorrow afternoon. So it's a fun weekend coming up. Um, and, too, and I, I'm just looking at the pictures here, and I see um, I, I see Wendy Williams there. And, and so my only claim to fame, uh, other than Greenhouse, is that Wendy Williams really likes my barbecue and actually requests some of my seasoning uh, through – uh, through the mail, I send her seasoning every now and then. So uh, that's my claim to fame. My goodness, yes. Yeah, I saw her in there, and I thought, hmm, there must have been, like, she was a judge or something, I'm guessing, at one of them. She was, but we yeah. met and, and fell in love. Oh. <laughs> but Wendy is not your wife, right? <laughs> oh, she's not. She's not. No, I'm, I'm, I think the other picture shows my beautiful wife, uh, Beth, and... My two sons and uh, we. Uh, Beth is actually a physician, so we get to talk healthcare a lot. And and the fun thing related to Greenhouse when we first met, um, she said, "You work in nursing homes, and as an emergency medicine doctor, I can't stand nursing homes. They always send people that they shouldn't send, and when they send them, the care's not good." And I said, "Well, you never got anybody from our nursing home then." Um, but uh, it is fun to introduce her, having introduced her to the greenhouse concept, and she is just a huge fan and a big advocate for culture change uh, now as well. Nice. Very nice. Okay, well, thank you for giving us, like, a little insight. I think it's always kind of fun to take a look at, you know, we're, as we say, it's all about our meaningful life and really getting to know people, so it's kind of a nice way to, to start off these um, portrait webinar series. So. Here's a picture of um, St. Martin's in the Pines, and I just thought 
you know, before we get into some of the background and, and your journey, um, tell us just a little bit about the campus itself, the, the greenhouse homes that you have. Certainly. So St. Martin's has been around for 60 years now, starting out as a, a nursing home and then added assisted living and independent living. And we do home care as well. So a, a true old school uh, CCRC. Uh, we went through a process back in the early 2000s of saying, what do we want to do next? And part of that was to redevelop the campus and the largest um, oldest and ugliest building on campus, um, some debate that, but uh, at that time the decision was made that the first building to replace had to be this old nursing home we had. And we started looking at ways to do that on our campus and decided uh, through lots of study to do it in a couple of phases, but uh, built six greenhouse homes. We were the, the first to actually stack them on top of each other to, to go vertical. We just didn't have enough land to do single-story construction, so we chose three-story buildings, and each uh, floor is a separate 10-bedroom home. And for outdoor space, we convinced Dr. Thomas we could use screened-in porches because that's what you do in the in the South. You don't sit on a patio. You sit on a porch with a ceiling fan and, and in a rocking chair with iced tea. And uh, he, he bought into that, and it's just worked very nicely uh, for us since 2008 now. So... Today we have nine greenhouse uh, houses operating. Uh, so for 90 elders, uh, we have um, our legacy building we've converted to more of a short stay rehab, post acute type unit. We have memory care assisted living, regular assisted living, independent living, and an in a 10 bed inpatient hospice is operating on our campus as well. Okay, great. Thank you. So that sort of gives us a, a nice overview, and I think we'll get into that a little bit more in just a little bit. But let's talk just a little bit about you and how you kind of got into the business. I don't know if there was a person who kind of had influence on you or you just, you know, were attracted to elders or how that kind of <laughs> came about. And I just, these are just a series of pictures of you with, with some of the elders, I'm sure, that, that you work with or that are part of St. Martin. You know, I I think if I reflect back and, you know, things are a lot more clear uh, after you've already experienced them, but I, I really know now that the person who had influence on me getting into health care was my mother. And, and isn't that nice? I think our parents obviously have influences on, on all of us, but I saw her as she was raising um, a young family with myself, my brother, and my sister. I saw her during that time always helping other people. She came from a very large family, so her mom was um, ill. Her aunt was well, helping care for aunts and elderly neighbors. Uh, she was truly a caregiver, and and I saw that, and that was just what I thought mothers did. And then while we're in high school, she decided to start another career in nursing, and she went to nursing school, and then she is still actually working today uh, as a nurse. So. I know for a fact now, looking back, that she had the most influence of me getting into health care. Um, I really thought I'd be in business and finance, and that's what I studied, and that's what my degree is in. But I found a position working in the National Home Health Company and worked in finance for a long time uh, for them, but found an opportunity to jump into operations and fell in love with that side of the business and, and have done operations working with home health agencies, hospitals, and, of course, now at St. Martin's uh, for my entire career. Yeah, nice story. I mean, always connecting it. You know, your folks always have a, a real, real influence on you. So here's a great picture of some um, shovels with the, the homes in the background. So talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned it earlier that, like, in the year 2000, you were thinking about, you know, what do we need to do? And... Um, talk about how you heard about the model itself, and then really what was your process for kind of deciding to go in that direction? We were, so when I was, um, when, when I became part of the St. Martin's team in 2000, the, the board of directors at the time, they were really looking for what happens next. They started asking the question of, of we've done some great things since 1955, and we've kind of added on to the campus since then, but, but 
what's next? How can we continue the, the spirit of innovation? So I really enjoyed coming into the organization at a time where that kind of reflection and planning was going on. So not long after me coming, they really started a very formal long-range planning process that included board members, community members, staff members, and how they wanted to identify how we might begin replacing the oldest building on the campus, as I mentioned earlier. That was definitely the nursing home. And I think many of you might know one of my colleagues um, who was here at St. Martin's at the time, Linda Robertson. She's been part of Greenhouse uh, since its beginning. She was an Eden Alternative Associate. She was here uh, working as administrator for our, our nursing home. And in some of her Eden Alternative um, emails or news story or newsletter, something that came through, she saw a story uh, during uh, this whole process of planning about Mississippi Methodist Senior Services and the greenhouse homes that they had built at their Traceway campus in Tupelo, Mississippi. There was a workshop uh, in this story. They were advertising a workshop that was to be held just a few weeks away. And since Tupelo is only two hours from Birmingham, we decided uh, to attend and to learn what the this new model was all about so that we could then inform the board and, and really uh, inform the entire planning process as we were identifying what a new nursing home uh, might look like. The um, I guess the next step, um, we came back, and, and three of us went, the CFO, myself, and Linda, and we came back saying, um, that's a pretty neat concept, and we really like it. How in the world would we make it work here at St. Martin's? Number one, we knew we didn't have enough land uh, to do what they had done there in Tupelo. Um, but we decided to try to figure it out. So uh, one of the things I knew I had to do as CEO is to get board member buy-in, and that they have to champion these, these kind of big ideas. So we sent, um, there were subsequent workshops. So for one of those, we sent um, three members uh, of the board who who sometimes could be um, maybe hard to convince, um, shall we say, uh, kind of those type board members and and really tired a lot following the workshop. They came back from Tra Traceway and, and they were convinced we had to find a way to make it work here and their enthusiasm really started the flame with the rest of the board and then really even the broader community that, that helped us to the point where we can make it happen. I would I would think that the board of directors is always that important piece to really get that going. But in light of what you just said, it's really that seeing is believing, correct? I think it is. And and one thing, and I am grateful to the board for identifying this, but because of our experiences of seeing them believing, then than really having the fire to, to do that. They made a commitment early on, and they said, we will not do this by ourselves. We will not do this and then close the gate. We want other people to come and see what we're doing so that they might go back to their own organizations and do it themselves. And we have had many, many, many organizations, including uh, one just last week that brought a whole team down to, to see how we do it. and and to understand the model, and then uh, we hope that that has helped encourage and invigorate the, the missions uh, back in their own organizations. It is. I think, you know, once you open, it is kind of being that, as as Rachel will say, that brand ambassador so that you can, you know, help others and, and help them on the journey because, obviously, Tupelo helped you on, on your journey. So Absolutely. talk a little bit more about when you actually made this decision then. I think that the actual sort of um, development itself is, you know, a key part. So how did you handle those development costs? And did you have to, you know, do other special things when you when you built the homes? How did, how did that work? Yeah, I think, you know, the first thing we had to do is really engage the greenhouse project um, we knew going vertical was going to create some some challenges within the typical uh, greenhouse idea, and so we uh, engaged the the national project and and began working with them formally so that we could work through the design issues. Um, we knew we would have regulatory issues. We were not the um, 
we were the first in Alabama to go down this uh, culture change road, and so part of um, the work that the project did with us was training the Department of Public Health, the nursing home regulators um, were trained by the greenhouse staff, and, and that just worked absolutely beautiful. And then uh, we had played around with some culture change training, but we knew that we had a pretty steep hill to climb to get all of our staff up to speed on culture change and the greenhouse process. And uh, But really the training opportunities from greenhouse were just so robust. And we were back in the early days. It's even better uh, now. And then our board, um, particularly in working, choosing to work with the greenhouse model, said we think, and we had a, a physician, a retired physician who was a, a cardiothoracic surgeon, retired surgeon, and he knew the value of research, and he always talked about, um, uh, as he was president of the board, was the importance of research, and we had to prove that this model worked. So every time we had Dr. Rosalie Kane or any other researchers uh, write an article, he was all over that and, and really uh, found tremendous value of being part of the Greenhouse Project due to the research that came out. Uh, and we try to continue to participate in those research projects as they come around. Um, we recognize that uh, we couldn't do it by ourselves in all of those areas. So um, once we had this wonderful collaborative design developed, then the hard parts came of trying to afford it. And that we had a few challenges. Some were, were site-related. Uh, we actually had a great spot on campus, but the soil there was not suitable for building, so we had to literally uh, line up um, dump trucks, and we we offloaded um, just hundreds of loads of earth, and then right behind that we brought in hundreds of loads of good earth. So that expense would have been there regardless of what we decided to put on that piece of uh, land on our campus. Uh, but it did add additional costs that we had to deal with uh, through the through the construction. When you go vertical, it adds uh, some additional costs. So there are um, stairwells that you have to add. That's more square feet uh, for the building. You have to add an elevator. Elevators cost a lot of money, uh, we found out. And it just requires a different type of construction than one story construction. And those, those costs um, escalate uh, as you go up. But you don't have as much land um, cost. Uh, unfortunately, we had to remediate the land, but typically going vertical can uh, can be a wash, but not for us. So we were through phasing it in and through getting some good financial uh, consultants in to help us with some uh, refinancing, and, and we did borrow some money um, to make phase one happen. Uh, we were able to build the two three-story buildings. Um, and and knew that we'd be successful from an occupancy standpoint as soon as we opened those up, and, and that has shown true. So typical challenges, uh, we found a way to make it work. We had uh, a board that supported us um, as staff tried to help solve those challenges, and, you know, we just we stayed in communication with the Greenhouse Project and the board and the staff and the regulators, and it was just a big team and took a lot of a lot of effort, but uh, after a couple of years, it all came came together. So I want to talk, at a, you know, in a couple of minutes about um, that competitive advantage. But before we get there, talk a little bit about that financial viability. I mean, you know, the cost shifting that sort of occurs, you know, to flatten that hierarchy, but also just, you know, the ability for the, you know, there are many who kind of challenge whether it is a, a cost-effective model. Yeah, and we, you know, we we hear that all the time as well, but the cost shifting really does work. And we were just describing to some students who were coming through this morning, it really is about a, it's kind of a middle management shakeup. So you flatten the hierarchy of the organization, you push out more um, uh, staff to the front line, uh, there's, so there's more cost at the front line, but you try to be efficient in the support areas and and the greenhouse model just works beautifully for that for that shifting. So it is true that we have a flatter organization, we have a, a more efficient nursing structure in the greenhouse homes, and we try to hold that same efficiency in food service and housekeeping and uh, those things. You know, we, but we have to focus on it every day. And 
you know, it, it's definitely true when you look at the big finance picture, it's absolutely true that we spent more on construction of a greenhouse home than we would have spent building a new traditional style nursing home. But uh, the operational cost structure really allows us to commit more resources because we're, we're saving here and there on the operational side. We're able to commit more of our resources toward the capital expense. So it, it works. And, you know, I think, um, thankfully now we have many organizations that are, that are proving uh, that it works. Good insight. I mean, really, because there are many who, who really kind of wonder about that. So talk a little bit about the competitive advantage. I mean, we've got the, we've got the artist rendering up. Um, was it really, did it really set you apart? And do you still see that today? You know, it was, we had no idea what was going to happen. But it, it's very interesting looking back and evaluating. Once we opened the cottages, our greenhouse homes, we saw a corresponding increase in our, our assisted living and independent living occupancy of around 45%. So, and, and that means we went from around 92, 94% to over 95% occupancy in both levels of care. And from a financial standpoint, that's a significant revenue yeah. influx uh, to our organization. <laughs> and we think it's because as part of the continuum of care, uh, we offer uh, empty cottages, greenhouse rooms as they become available to people already on our campus, kind of in a priority admission process. So we, we know that our residents on campus in all levels of care see the greenhouse homes as a far better way of living than the, quote, uh, old nursing home. So they enter our system earlier, we believe, and that has led to an increase in occupancy in those other levels of care. Uh, which then leads to more revenue to the organization. So um, that's a uh, uh, that was a surprise benefit um, that we weren't expecting, but we did see that corresponding uh, to the same time frame. I'm getting some feedback. I don't know if we could keep lines. To do? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I'll go ahead and mute. So just hold on one second. All guests have been muted. Okay, so we're back, Terry. Um, okay, am I still in? <laughs> yes, I'm you are. Um, okay, gotcha. That's why we have you call in on that other code. Um, gotcha. So you've actually made a decision now to build more homes, yes? That's right. Well, we, we made the decision after a few years to start Phase 2. We had done a capital campaign and raised... Um, for the most part, enough funding to build three more greenhouse homes. So we we started that and opened those in 2012. And then the other thing I really wanted to ask about, just along those same lines, is that you feel pretty passionate about the model integrity sort of process that, that we're working on. And, and I'll, at the end of the webinar, I'll tell people that you're actually at the conference and you're going to be speaking on that. But I thought it might be nice to talk about how important you feel that greenhouse trademark is and how, um, why you are so passionate about model integrity. Well, a lot of reasons. Number one, I think the brand matters, and I think it, it has some meaning. Uh, and if we all do it in the right way and follow the, the principles, those, those guiding um, points that we're all supposed to be following, that then we can actually count that the research we're doing uh, is accurate because we're all doing things in similar ways. And I get so worried that people are going to use the greenhouse name and, and use that for something that is very different than what was imagined back in in 2000 when Tupelo um, started the process. And so I think it's so important from a model integrity standpoint that we all hold ourselves accountable uh, to those um, principles that we, you know, bought into to begin with, knowing that they're difficult. Uh, we didn't get into it because it was easy. We got into it because it was the right thing. Uh, but doing it in the right way is why we're having the outcomes that we're having. So if we start letting that be diluted, then the outcomes are going to change. So, so heck yeah, I'm passionate because we've invested a lot of, of resources uh, into this model, and we we think it works. 
and we want to do it in the right way, and we want all of our peers in the in the greenhouse network to do it um, the right way as well. And you feel so passionate that really, um, I'm trying to think if it was this last year, that, that you really talked about wanting to make sure that um, that St. Martin's really, you know, made sure that they were, you know, really working on it and sustaining that. And so you actually talk a little bit about how important you feel education is for the team and that it's ongoing and that, that people keep talking about what really needs to be happening within the homes. Sure. You know, two things in our organization. Uh, one, we've just been doing it for a long time. And as years go by, I mean, we've been in the greenhouse training mode since 2006. So, you know, that's that's 10 years. And as time goes by, people retire, new people come into the organization. Um, we found ourselves with a, a slew of new even leadership positions who, yes, had gotten some anecdotal training, um, some passed down training uh, about the model and and certainly were, you know, excellent members of the greenhouse team, uh, but there was something lacking, I think, in the fact that they weren't part of the beginning. They weren't part of the excitement and the thrill of the, kind of being the first greenhouse home in Alabama and putting all that together and identifying ways to make it work um, and wondering if when the surveyors come in for annual survey, what are they going to think? Are they going to try to shut us down? Or are they going to like it? And then experiencing that, uh, that um, you know, the, the exit interview for the first survey and, and the surveyors there in tears because they liked it so much. I mean, they missed out on so much of the positive things that create passion. And we wanted an opportunity to to start that over again to kind of say, hey, uh, this this is why we do this, really breaking the model back down and saying this is why it makes sense and looking at how we were doing things and had we slipped away, had some of the dragons come in, had we been slipping on some of the, the guiding principles. And so I think the model integrity process and then uh, we had uh, Marla come down through a sustaining, um, I forget the name of the coaching, somebody help me. What's the name of that uh, that program? Coaching the, Process to Sustaining Change? Close enough. Something. Coaching Approach okay. to Sustaining Change. Coaching that, Approach that magic, to Sustaining. That's right. I was going to say that magic other voice now that you hear is Rachel Shear McLean. So she's she's in the room with me. <laughs> okay, great. I'm glad you're there, Rachel, because I lost the I lost the name. But um, <laughs> that is a program now that organizations can engage the Greenhouse Project in to really uh, – bring the team back in, the leadership team, and, and really identify those things that we could do better, but also kind of revisit the beginnings of, of why we're doing it to begin with. And uh, it, it's been good. Now, out of that uh, came a whole lot of work we needed to do, and so we're engaging now in, into action plans to, to you know, make some improvements uh, here and there. And uh, But I, think we, I don't think we can do enough training. I don't think we can talk about the model enough, and, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do around here, but I, I think some of it's just from a, a timing standpoint. It's just we've been doing it a long time, and it's not new anymore. So we got to continually, continually try to keep it fresh. I think that that is really such a good point, that, that you do need to keep it fresh, and I appreciate the fact that you care so much about those that have come on after um, the homes initially open because there is all that excitement. And then if you're hired later on, you maybe really don't understand what had happened. You mentioned leadership, and I guess I'd like to have you talk a little bit about that, how important it is for the leadership to really be doing, you know, really be the champion and really be the person who um, is making sure that the, that the model is there and that um, it is kept intact. I, you know, leadership is all about problem solving and motivating and doing those things that um, sometimes no one else will will pick up and do. And I, I think, uh, particularly here in our case, it's um, it's having our leadership team understand kind of the the, the end game, which is we're going to be very different. And when it comes to nursing home care, we're going to do the right things for the elder. Sometimes that means that um, we have to 
uh, think about things very differently from an efficiency standpoint, from how to how to get from A to B in a very different way, and encouraging uh, staff and and ensuring that uh, from a model perspective that that we're coaching and not ordering and you know all those things are so difficult um, when you're when you're trying to, to turn these these institutional type models into to something um, uh, very different uh, for for the elders and so I think it does take the leadership I, I try to be for myself and and I know many of our other leadership team we try to be so consistent in our messaging and even though it's sometimes uh, difficult to to make it through um, every problem using the the greenhouse uh, model and the self managed work teams get in the way it seems sometimes, but we just try to be consistent uh, to say this makes sense. We have to try to make it work, and we're going to use all the princi uh, principles we can uh, to to be successful. Uh, so it's it, it's leadership, and it's not easy. I, I I totally agree, and I think it's so very important when you talked about the the consistency because that is that the message needs to be consistent. Um, and I was actually I was trying to think of like what was that term I wanted um, for leadership. I feel that leadership is really the keeper of the philosophy, and and yeah. you are in that you're in that role. So let's talk a little bit about. Um, how important it is, this is like a shot from, from long ago, and there's Linda Robertson down there in the lower left-hand corner with her hard hat. <laughs> Talk about how important it is to find the right people to really um, be those folks in the homes. You know, it's uh, that's the trick, right? Um, it takes the right people uh, in the positions, and we know we have the right positions. Uh, I think the model says these are the positions and these things work. Uh, but then you have to find the right people to, to fill those roles. And and here we were doing a replacement nursing home project, so we first trained those existing certified nursing assistants who were interested to learn about the greenhouse model. We said if you're interested, then let's learn about it. And, and really they have done an unbelievable job transitioning from the traditional role they were in to the self-managed work team. Uh, now that we've been operating for a few years, we can say there are certainly some qualities or maybe some life experiences that can lead to a successful candidate, a successful uh, Shabazz. And so as we try to bring in new staff, we look at some of those qualities, um, like uh, hiring individuals who, who already had some past cooking skills. I mean, that, that's obviously a, a benefit. Uh, who may have been part of a larger family growing up. So uh, kind of being part of this uh, large meal time and, and this busy household. Um, if you've never been part of that, I imagine that would be a, a difficult uh, situation. So it makes it easier. Um, those who are self-motivated, self-managed work teams require some self-motivation. And then those who really enjoy engaging uh, with other people. Not everyone's engaging. So those who enjoy engaging in conversation and, and all those skills that obviously create the awesome Shabazim that uh, we have uh, here today. So um, it's not easy to find the right people. I would say it's um, similar though to hiring anyone for any position. You want to make sure they have those backgrounds and experiences that matter for the job duties. It just um, happens to be that some of our jobs like a Shabazz position requires a very varied um, background and experience to, to be successful. So in the picture that we're looking at, um, I happened to read the article that kind of talked about a little bit of the journey that St. Martin's had. So you actually uh, assisted folks initially in the beginning to obtain their CNA, correct? We if did. We sent. That's right. So when we transitioned, um, we knew there could be a decrease in house, number of housekeeping staff and uh, food service staff, and we offered anyone who wanted to go through CNA school uh, to go, and we would help um, uh, you know resource that. And we had several take us up on that, and they uh, graduated from their certified nursing assistant program, and then went uh, directly into our Shabazine training program, and they graduated from that. And I think the picture there is following one of our uh, Shabazine training program. 
uh, we have a graduation ceremony, and, and she's there getting her um, Shabazine pin. Yeah, that's great. Very, it's really nice. So let's just switch a little bit from actually hiring the right stuff. Let's kind of talk about the model itself in terms of how the greenhouse homes really position you um, for success with the current healthcare reforms and the kinds of things that are happening, you know, across the country today. How do you feel about the model in, in terms of how it helps you in that area? Yeah, I think the model, the model certainly is a positive because we we think we think it yields better outcomes because we have higher levels of knowing uh, of what's going on and conditions of of the elders living there. And if you know more about their health care condition, you can intervene earlier with nursing and physician care and try to prevent a hospitalization. So we we know that our hospitalization rates are extremely low. Uh, we've been able to take our legacy building um, and convert it to really a short-stay rehab unit. We're partnering with local hospitals and helping them with their readmission control programs. Um, so our greenhouse homes are primarily long-term care, but if an elder there has an acute stay at a hospital or needs rehab when they're back, uh, they can go back to their greenhouse home and our therapists actually visit there. So um, we do some of the rehab in the homes, but predominantly it's done up in our rehab center. Um, you know, I think the ability to to know the residents, to know the elders, and to notice the decline or change in condition uh, in that small environment it just makes sense, and it's it's making an impact. I think. I th I think that that's oh so correct. I mean, there's definitely those many homes that now are in development are really they're adding that that rehab part because who wouldn't want to just really have that rehabilitation in a smaller environment where you're around others? So it makes it makes total sense. But the model it's it's good for what is happening across the country. So talk a little bit about, you know, our research actually shows that, you know, people are willing to drive further and pay more to, you know, have their loved ones live in a greenhouse home. Have you found this to be true? I mean, in terms of your marketing and what you're doing there in the in the Birmingham area? Uh, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, maybe somebody in our organization, I don't measure drive time of family members, but uh, here's what I know. Um, I know that we've been at 100% occupancy in the greenhouse home since 2008. Um, that's significant. We know uh, that our other levels of care on campus have increased their occupancy percentages. That's financially significant. Uh, we know our private pay occupancy for our long-term care has increased uh, and that we still see a, a just a very strong demand for what we do. Uh, and we know that family satisfaction scores are higher in our cottages versus our other skilled nursing beds on campus. So so that tells me, yeah, if you have all that going on, something, there's a little bit of magic uh, taking place, and I would think people uh, would drive further for that. Okay. Um, talk, you talked a little bit about private pay. So just talk in terms of, like, I don't know what percent are on Medicaid that you serve, but talk about how the greenhouse model and the mission for your organization, how, how that matches or how that really um, aligns for you? Sure. Um, around 40%, I believe, of our skilled nursing occupancy uh, is Medicaid. And from our mission standpoint, uh, our board very early on in planning decided we would not require the, um, the traditional private room differential uh, and we would allow Medicaid beneficiaries to live in our cottage greenhouse homes with no additional charge, even though it's a private room, private bath. And it is a significant commitment uh, for our organization, uh, and you know, we're trying to make that, that work into the future. Um, so far, so good. Uh, we don't have any plans to, to change that, um, but, you know, it's a, it's a very large component of kind of our community give back is – is allowing that that private room, and we want to do it and plan to do it as long as we can. Um, it's certainly the right thing to do. It is. That's that's so very nice. Um, 
this next one is just, I just want you to tell me, it's such a fun picture. So was this when the homes first opened? I mean, she, if people can't read it, it says, I'm a fan of the cottages at St. Martin's. That's, I think that was a very hot day, if I'm remembering correctly, and we're outside. And that is, I believe, at phase one groundbreaking, and that is Miss uh, Jessie Humphreys, uh, who one of our greenhouse homes is named after Miss Humphreys. She was the first um, uh, one of the first elders to live there and, and had been uh, on our campus for many, many years. Uh, has since passed away, but her legacy will live on here for a long, long time. She was uh, an old uh, old nurse and uh, actually uh, was uh, very instrumental here with the University of Alabama in Birmingham and, and their medical center. So uh, it's fun to have her and have her legacy here. And just a really, I mean, just a, a great, great picture, I think. So, great fun. So, um, we're almost 45 minutes into this, and so I guess I would like to um, ask you if um, we opened your memoir to the chapter on the greenhouse, how would you, how would you like it, it to end? <laughs> how would you like it to read? Well, that... So that assumes I'm going to have a memoir, uh, number one. Um, I would, uh, you know, and I, and I just read this quote again um, uh, just a, a little bit ago, and, I, and I've heard this so many times around the greenhouse community, and, and I think it really sums up our collective journey uh, is when uh, Maya uh, Angelo said, I did then. Uh, and I'll, I know I'm going to mess this up. I, I think it was I did then what I knew how to do, and now I know better, so I do better. And, you know, I really think the greenhouse journey started with just the idea, this notion that long-term care uh, could be better, uh, thanks to Dr. Thomas and Steve McAlilly in Mississippi. Um, uh, they said, yeah, we can make this better despite the challenges of this decades-old, this ingrained institutional model we had and uh, really a model that was created out of circumstances, not because it was it made any sense to anyone. And then so those brave souls uh, kind of took the lead, and they had the courage to say it can be better, and here's how we'll make it better. And then they took the next leadership step, which is to say we're going to take the knowledge we have, we're going to show other people how to do it, and um, we're hoping that they'll do the same thing. And, you know, 10 years later, uh, in, in my greenhouse chapter, uh, I think, I'm satisfied to see that the Greenhouse Peer Network says there's still more to do, that it can still be better. We're not done yet. And that's how I hope the Greenhouse chapter would end for me then, um, that I joined a movement of courageous change agents, and, and together we never became satisfied that we know everything we need to know uh, when it comes to caring for elders. Okay. That was beautiful, really. Very, very nice. Anything else that you would like to, and then we'll unmute the lines and see if people have questions for you. I have a few final slides, but um, anything else that we've kind of missed, Terry, that you would just like to share with the folks who are on this webinar? Yeah, I, I think we had a good um, a good discussion. I I just like, I think a lot of, I'm looking at the numbers over here. It looks like a lot of people from St. Martin's are here. And, you know, I think I would be remiss not to recognize um, eight years worth of just tremendous uh, effort uh, and and work and sweat and tears uh, of of the team that has made this happen. So it certainly doesn't happen from from one leader. Uh, it takes a whole team of leaders uh, to to make it happen, formal and informal. And so just giving all those guys um, out there on the phone a shout-out <laughs> today. Okay, nice. Nice way to, to end that. Okay, so I'm going to try to magically unmute the phone, so we'll see if this works. All guests have been unmuted. Okay, so I'm just going to open it up in case if anyone has a question for um, Terry. And you can either, you know, just pop on and ask your question, or if you want to type it in the chat box if there's something. Um, and that would be, we'd be happy to take it. So 
if there's no questions. Um, I am going to let you know that um, Terry will be part of the uh, eighth annual Greenhouse Meeting and Celebration, and so he will be speaking at a session on model integrity, research, and sustainability, all items that he actually covered in this webinar. And that's at the conference on Tuesday, November 17th. That's when that session actually takes place. We, of course, still would love to have you register for the conference. Um, it will be November 16th through the 18th, and it's in Colorado. Um, there are the prices, and you can also find out more information, if you'd like, by going to the actual Peer Network website. And then the last thing I want to tell you, we haven't quite finalized all the details or the title or anything, but I just want you to mark down we want to um, – we're going to have a, a webinar on veterans and the greenhouse homes that we have actually worked through with the Department of Veterans Affairs, just kind of talking about what, what the homes have been like, what that vision was, how that really came to be, and then also the unique needs. And it's a, a beautiful kind of piece to do the week of um, the veterans holiday. So that will be Monday, November 9th, and that will be uh, 3 o'clock Eastern time. And so hopefully you'll all join us. We'll send out a, a notice on that. And um, I guess the only other thing is that, Terry, I just want to say thank you so very much for, you know, sharing your journey and sharing your wisdom and your insight and being such a, a good keeper of the philosophy. It was a pleasure to be on, and I look forward to seeing everyone in, in Colorado. Excellent. Yes, yes, yes. So thank you, everyone, for being on, and have an absolutely wonderful weekend. You too.